Welcome to the Audacious Living Podcast, hosted by my man, Audley Stevenson, the odd man. He'll unpack wisdom and insights from a cross-section of top quality performers in business, media, sports, entertainment, and lifestyle to uncover key elements to help you live your best audacious life ever. So without further ado, here is The Odd Man. Greetings and salutations. I'm Audley Stevenson, and this is the Audacious Living Podcast. Thank you so much for taking a moment out of your day and tuning in to hands down the most audacious podcast the internet has to offer. It's always a pleasure to be here as we continue our ongoing goal of helping you live your best audacious life ever. As always, um, uh, I would encourage you to stay connected to us through our, our social media channels. Uh, on Twitter and Instagram, we go by the handle The Audacious Pod. And then on uh, Facebook, if you search The Audacious Living Podcast, you certainly will find us. And I'd ask that you join our community. Also on our YouTube channel, if you tap the uh, notification bell, uh, every time there's new video content that comes to our YouTube channel where you also can watch the podcast, uh, you will be alerted each and every time. So. Uh, Follow, like, subscribe, tell a friend, and let's keep uh, this connection going. Now, the focus of uh, today's episode of the podcast is all about overcoming life's obstacles, challenges, and the mountains that we have to climb to, to get over them. They're a reality of life and something that we all have to face. Uh, And uh, I'm actually really super excited about this week's guest because Allison Levine is the perfect person to have this conversation about overcoming mountains and challenges. And I think that the perspective that she offers and that she can provide uh, is great, great, great context. So really happy uh, to have Allison Levine joining us. Uh, She's got a lot on her plate. She's a leadership expert, uh, an author, uh, a polar explorer, a mountaineer, um, and she really is no stranger when it comes to extreme environments. Uh, She has the distinction of being the team captain of the first ever women's expedition to climb Mount Everest in 2010, and this would have been after an unsuccessful attempt eight years prior. Now, I want to zero in uh, for a quick moment uh, on the fact that this was her second attempt. Uh, she had led, like I said, she had led a team eight years prior, and they were only a, sh- a few hundred sh- uh, yards shy of the summit when they had to turn back around due to weather conditions. And, and you, you think about uh, the, the, the journey, you know, you're up on that mountain for, you know, two months trying to get to the summit, and you've got to turn around and come back because of something totally out of your control. Life is going to throw all kinds of stuff at us that might knock us down or or cause us to to take a step back. But this doesn't mean that we stop working towards the top. And actually, it's sometimes through those setbacks that we learn the most about ourselves. Allison does a phenomenal job in hitting home this point uh, through her real life (laughs) illustrations of climbing Mount Everest. And I I really think it's a great chat that you'll all enjoy. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Allison Levine. Enjoy. So, so Allison, I uh, really appreciate you, you, you taking the time to, to share with me on the podcast. Uh, uh, really, when we, we set this up a little while ago, and I was really looking forward to, to, to have this conversation with you, because uh, you know, b- being that the, the whole field of, in the world, if you will, of mountaineering and uh, adventure climbing is not my realm, it's really good to kind of hear from you. And I thought maybe as a starting point, if you sort of talk about kind of what, what got you into this direction uh, of, of this adventurous world that you're in. Right. So I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona and no mountains, no mountains, <laughs> Okay. extreme heat. Right. And when I was younger, I was always intrigued by the stories of the early Arctic and Antarctic explorers and the early mountaineers. I think because it was so damn hot in Arizona that it felt like an escape from the oppressive 
summer heat there. So I'd read these books and I'd watch these documentaries, but I never actually thought I would go to these remote places because I had some health challenges. So I was born with a hole in my heart that got bigger as I got older. And I had my first heart surgery when I was 17. And then that one, unfortunately, wasn't successful, but I had another one when I turned 30. That one was successful. And about 18 months after my second heart surgery, this light bulb went on in my head. And I thought, okay, if I want to know what it's like to be, you know, this polar explorer, Reinhold Messner, you know, who skis, you know, across Antarctica, the South Pole, then I should go ski across Antarctica. If I want to know what it's like to be these mountaineers going to the remote mountain ranges, then I should go to the mountain ranges instead of just watching documentaries about them. And if these other guys can do this stuff, why can't I do it too? So I actually didn't climb my first mountain until I was 32 years old. Okay. So Mm -hmm. that was the first time I started. And then I just got hooked and hadn't started, you know, haven't really stopped since, but, um, I definitely started later in life versus most people, but it's just been a passion since then. But yeah, I think from the time I was little, I just, I loved these places because it felt like an escape from the the Arizona summers. Well, yeah, it's, 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 it's a, you know, a whole different world, if you will, from what you know. And so I can sort of see where there's some curiosity. Is that safe to say as a curiosity? Yeah, I was really curious about them. And also, I think um, just kind of going back also to my, you know, my childhood, I grew up in a house where the, you know, my mom had these rules, no whining, no crying, no complaining, no whining, no crying, no complaining. So I think that that also kind of served me well when I went to these environments, because it's difficult sometimes like the, you know, Antarctica coldest, windiest place on earth. You know, these, you go to these high mountains and you feel the altitude, right? You have altitude sickness and you're freezing and you're homesick, but, and if you can be the person to maintain a positive attitude and have a good outlook and have a good sense of humor, humor and encourage people when times are really, really difficult that's really valuable to a team. And that helps a team achieve success on a mountain. And I think because I grew up with that, that rule, no whining, no crying, no complaining, I carried that over to these other extreme environments. And that's also what helps me kind of get through the tough times in these environments. Gotcha. Gotcha. I I, I just so love the fact that you're able to pull from your different, these leadership lessons or lessons in general in life, because it doesn't just apply to leadership, but just life lessons from, from these experiences. And and you talked about the environment. So let's kind of go there because oftentimes there's things that are happening around you that you've got no control over. You've got no say as to when it starts or when it stops, or if it continues, right. nothing like that, but you still have to, to manage. How, 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 what is kind of the starting point in sort of dealing with these sort of situations? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, I, I used to, I do a lot of keynote speaking and I used to talk about how these remote extreme environments that I'm in, mm-hmm. where you don't have control over, you know, the environment as things around your shifting, changing, Those are, you know, kind of different from everyday business environments. Well, not anymore, not since Mm. COVID hit, right? So since March of last year, we are all in a remote extreme environment. We are all in these environments that are constantly shifting and changing because the reality is we have no idea what the rest of this week, you know, the rest of this year is going to look like, right? Right. We don't know what this year is going to look like. This month is going to look like. We don't know what the rest of this week is going to look like. We don't even really know what tomorrow is going to look like. So if we just know that we can adapt to whatever is going on, we know we can get through whatever comes our way. And so you just learn to, you learn that you, you cannot control the environment all you can do is control the way you react to it. And um, a friend of mine named Carrie Lorenz, who was mm-hmm. the Navy's first female F-14 pilot, recently released a book called Span of Control. And I read that book and I just found it so helpful because it really helps you hone in on the things you can control and kind of just release the things that you cannot control. And I didn't really realize how much those uncontrollable things were weighing on me, even though I knew I couldn't control them, they still kind of weighed on me. And when I learned to just push them out of my mind altogether, like it frees up a lot of space in your head. When you can get (laughs) rid of the stuff that is the clutter that's causing anxiety, when you can rid your mind of that, it frees up a lot of space for other things. So I just really focus on the things that I can control. And I know that I can just control my reactions. And I know that, 
you know, look, we've all been through tough times since COVID hit and we're going to have tough times going forward. But I think the beauty of it is that, look, we've made it this far. Mm -hmm. We can keep going. We can make it going forward, whatever comes our way we're going to be able to handle it. And I'm not saying it's going to be easy. Right. And I'm not saying it's going to be pleasant all the time, but look, we know we can do it. Yeah. There's so much value in being, and, and from even the, the, from as a mountaineer, right. There's so much value looking back at look, look how far I've come. Right. So, yes. you know, this is where I'm going to, and, and, and it inspires you, motivates yourself because you're like, okay, I've done it. Just kind of keep going. The, the whole aspect of uh, letting go, that's tough for people though, right, Allison? Yeah. Like to be, especially when you, uh, you know, people who plan as an example, who like to plan and have things all laid out. And then all of a sudden, everything I planned has to go by the wayside because a situation I've got no control over has right. changed that. And the planning that you talk about mm-hmm. is what brings a lot of people comfort, right? Mm-hmm. Having yes. that plan brings people comfort. And so I think that is part of what has been so difficult Um, with COVID. And, you know, I think planning is really valuable. Planning is great. Planning keeps you motivated, keeps you on track, keeps you focused. But what you have to remember is that when you are in environments that are constantly shifting and changing, which is of course what we have today, whatever plan you came up with is going to be outdated as soon as it's finished. So while I do think we should continue to plan, you can't be hell bent on sticking to that plan, no matter what you want to always be more focused on, you know, executing based on what is going on at the time, not based on your plan that is already outdated. Got you. That's right. Good point. Good point. Give me an example. So take me sort of in, you know, the climbing world, if you will, we'll give you an example of a situation where you would have to change course and you know the environment does something. And all of a sudden I'm like, okay, now what, what does that look like in the, in the, the context of climbing Mount Everest? Well, I'll tell you what's interesting about climbing Mount Everest. When you talk about changing course and changing mm-hmm. direction is a lot of people believe, you know, or would assume that you, when you climb Mount Everest, you start at base camp and then you climb to camp one and you climb okay. to camp two, right? You climb higher and higher and higher on the mountain. And then you reach the summit. Okay. No, that is actually not how it works. Um, the way you climb Everest isn't necessarily intuitive. So you, you do start at base camp. And then once you're used to the altitude there, you climb up to the, the first camp called camp one. Okay. And yeah. you spend the night at camp one. And the next day, after you spend the night up at camp one, it's a little over 20,000 feet. After you spend the night at camp one, the next day you come back down to base camp again. And then you spend a few nights back down at base camp again. And then you climb to camp one again for okay. a second time. And then the next day, then you climb up to camp two. Camp two is about 21,500 feet about above sea level. Okay. You spend the night up there at 21,500 feet above sea level. And after you spend the night up there, the next day you come back down to base camp again. And then you spend more nights at base camp and then you climb to camp one again and spend the night. You climb to camp two again, spend the night. Then you climb all the way to camp three. Camp three is almost 24,000 feet on the side of the mountain, right? 24,000 feet. That is higher than anything in, yeah. you know, the, the United States, right? Denali is the highest peak in, in yep. the U S it's in Alaska. It's over 20,000 feet, but so you're up to 24,000 feet. And then you come back down to base camp again. So the crazy thing is you, you climb higher and you keep coming back down to base camp, which is at about 17,500 feet. And the reason you have to keep coming back down to base camp is because you have to let your body get used to the altitude very slowly. It's this uh, process called acclimatization. And it you have to get used to the altitude slowly because if someone were to drop you off at the top of the mountain, if you could be dropped off there by a plane or a helicopter, some kind of magic spaceship, you know, dropped you off on the summit, you would be dead in a matter of minutes from the altitude. Mm. So you move up the mountain slowly to give your body time to adjust and acclimate, but the crazy thing is the catch is that anytime you're above about 18,000 feet, okay. which is any camp above that base camp. So all the camps above base camp are okay. above 18,000 feet. Your body is also starting to deteriorate and your muscles are getting weaker. So it's this crazy catch 22 of 
you want to spend time up high to get used to the altitude, right? Because right. when you spend time up high, your body manufactures more red blood cells. Those red blood cells carry oxygen throughout your body. Gotcha. So you need more red blood cells, yep. but then your muscles are getting weaker. So you want to spend time up high because you want the blood cells, but then you have to keep coming back down low so you can eat, sleep, right. rehydrate, and regain some strength since gotcha. your muscles are deteriorating. So while you know you need to be going up the mountain to get to the summit, you are spending a hell of a lot of time climbing down, down the mountain. And so not only is it very physically challenging to be climbing up and down and up higher and down and up even higher yep, and yep. back down, but psychologically it is very challenging as well because you know you need to go up to get to the top, but right. you're spending so much time climbing in a downward direction. And it's really easy to feel like you're not making progress, yes. but you are making progress because you're helping your body with that acclimatization process. And I really want people to think about how they define progress, right? Because we tend to think that when we have a goal, that progress needs to occur in one particular direction. We tend to think that progress is linear. Like we're moving in this direction, we're making progress in this one direction, but sometimes you are going to have to go backwards for a bit in order to eventually get to where you wanna be. So I really want people to remember that sometimes when you're backtracking, you're still making progress and, and don't be discouraged by that. And don't feel like you're losing ground because you're not moving toward your goal. Sometimes you can move in different directions yep. and still achieve your goal. And I actually have a phrase that I've, um, put, that I trademarked, but it's that backing up is not the same as backing down, right? Ah. Backing up is not the same as backing down. You are not backing down. You are not losing ground. You are not showing weakness. You are not showing it's you're not experiencing defeat. You're right. merely changing direction. And that is okay. And, and I can see where psychologically, yeah, as you said, people will kind of get discouraged or disheartened because it's like, wait a second, this is where I should be going, right. but I'm going in the opposite direction. And, and I think that's a really good illustration right. uh, because it's uh, so similar to taking baby steps, right? Sometimes right. if you're not making those big steps, you're not moving, but there is some sort of movement. So the same kind of principle and, that you're yeah, going there. Thinking about your, you know, people, when they think about their careers, sometimes mm. they're thinking, oh, I should have been promoted to this level, or I've been here at this amount of time. I should be at this level. I should be making this much money. I should have this title. I should, you know, and instead they get transferred to another department that they maybe didn't see as, you know, something that they were really excited about. And you just have to look at those moves as opportunities to be better going forward. And you don't lose sight of your goal. You don't let go of that dream. You just realize that this is a different direction. It's a new opportunity to gain some knowledge, to gain some strength so that you will be better out of the gates the next time around. I love it. I love it. That's a great one. That's a really, really good one. Um, you led an all female expedition, first female expedition up Mount Everest. That was in 2002. Yeah. Two. Yeah. And uh, got a lot of attention, uh, a lot of support. It was a big deal. Now it, it truly was. Uh, sort of, sort of talk about. Uh, I, don't, I know we'll, we'll get to the end, but before we get to the end, sort of talk about that lead up to that because I would imagine there were, were, were lots of uh, you know the, the anxiety, the butterflies, the, the excitement about what you were about to accomplish. Yes. Um... So we were the first American women's Everest expedition. This was back in 2002, as you mentioned. We were sponsored by the Ford Motor Company. So we had this amazing sponsor. There were five women. And we were, you know, we wanted to send this message about, you know, what a team of women can do when they lock arms and work together to achieve these big goals and do things that no, you know, no, no other team of American women had done. And we really wanted to send that message about getting out of your comfort zone and trying something that felt like it was out of reach, but you know, not being afraid to try it anyway. And then we got to within, we were, we were on the mountain for two months. Okay. That's how long an Everest expedition typically takes about two wow. months. And we got to within a couple hundred feet from the top, less than 300 feet from the top. 
And we had to turn around because of weather. A freak storm came in, you know, at 6.30 in the morning. And, you know, it's pretty typical for storms to come in in the late <laughs> afternoons. That's why if you, if you read the book Into Thin Air, uh, John Cracker, Krakauer talks about this turnaround time, right? One or 2 p.m., you know, by 2 p.m., you want to be going down the mountains. So you want to turn around by then. This is 6.30 in the morning, right. far from the turnaround time. So we thought we had it made, but then this storm, freak storm came in and we ended up abandoning our summit attempt just a couple hundred feet from, from the top. And what was so hard about it was that, you know, we had Ford, you know, our sponsors. So we wanted to, you know, come through for them, you know, unfurl the big Ford banner yeah. at the summit. And we had you know, 450 media outlets following our climb. Wow. This was long before social media. So to have 450 media outlets, we had global media coverage. Before we left for Everest, we did, you know, tons of media. We did the whole morning show circuit. The evening wow. news anchors were interviewing us. People are doing live updates from the mountain and we miss the top by such a small amount. And so what was so hard about that was then we had to come back from the trip Yes. And do all the media again, right? The post-trip media tour. Because of course, before the trip, yep. you know, everyone's like, oh, thanks for talking to us. Come back after the trip and let us know how it goes, you know, how it went. So we had to go back to all the same TV shows and, and talk about this big failure. And it was such a public failure with right. all that media yeah. coverage, right? Everyone knew we didn't make it. We and got almost so reliving close. it, re reliving it over and over yes, and over again. Every single time, right? So you walk into a TV interview and the people, you know, the host of the interview would be like, oh, welcome back. Oh, you know, this disappointed face. And I would explain, well, look, you know, uh, it was an altitude record for every single member of the team. And we just feel so fortunate that we even got a chance to go to the mountain and give yep. this a shot and yep. push our boundaries and try something really hard like this. And then they would say, yeah, but to, you know, to get that close and not make it, you know, how does that make you feel like a loser? You know, how do you think it makes me feel? Everyone was just so focused on the fact that right. it was like reliving it and reliving it. No, you didn't make it and la la la, you know? And, and so it was hard. We were the butt of Jay Leno's opening monologue joke. Just everyone focused on the fact that we didn't make it. And I really internalized that failure. And I regret that because I just felt like, I felt like I let everybody down. You know, right. I was the team captain for this trip. We didn't make it. We had all these people, you know, the media that was following our climb. Yeah. Discovery was doing, um, they didn't have the term blog at the time, but that's what they were doing. They okay. set up a website to yep. <laughs> report our As progress every yep. day. Yep. A, a blog. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, so everyone was following us and we didn't make it. And we just felt like we disappointed so many people and all the training, all the fundraising, you know, everything we did and we, we didn't make it. And so I just felt like I disappointed so many people. And I was so scared about, you know, everyone would say, you know, oh, you're going to go try it again. Are you going to try it again? And I'd say, no, I'm not going to try it again because I was so afraid of what would happen if I didn't mm. make it a second time. How would that look? How would that reflect on me? And um, long story short, it took me about eight years to get up the guts to go back and try it again. And I was inspired by a, a dear friend of mine who unfortunately passed away in 2009. She was only 37 years old. She right. died of the flu, by the way. This is pre-COVID. Mm. She died of just the, the regular old flu that right, any right. of us could pick. But she had um, weak lungs because she had uh, she beat lymphoma twice. Gotcha. And so she had had radiation, stem cell transplant, chemo, and all of that treatment damaged her lungs. And so she ended up getting a severe lung infection and she was this fearless person. I just felt like she was willing to try anything. And after she died, I really wanted to do something to honor her. So yep. I decided to go back to Mount Everest because I wanted to kind Amazing. of really embrace her spirit of fearlessness and her spirit of not being afraid to fail. And what I realized is that failure 
is just one thing that happens to you at one point in time. It doesn't define you. And yes. look, years later, when I would meet people, I'm sure nobody was being like, was going to think like, oh yeah, that's something that didn't summit Everest in 2002. <laughs> you know, nobody was saying that, but you tend to really focus on your failures and, and you have those voices of doubt that come back into your head. And so I needed to quiet those voices. I needed to remind myself that failure is nothing more than one thing that happens to you at one point in time. And also you can be scared mm -hmm. and brave at the same time. Yep. You can, you can be scared and brave at the same time. So I went back to that monster of a mountain eight years later in 2010 and did make it to the summit in honor of my girlfriend, Meg, who passed away. Yeah. I engraved her name in my ice axe and I had a nice. shirt with her name on it. And when I finally stood on the summit in 2010, I thought it was going to be this great moment in my life that it was going to eclipse all other moments. Sure. But I got to the summit and I was like, okay, this is just a pile of rock and ice. That's all it is. I am now standing what? on top of a pile of rock and ice. This does not change the world. And I thought everyone put so much emphasis on the summit. And for me, I really learned so much more on that 2002 expedition where we didn't make it mm -hmm. versus 2010 where we did, because it's those failures that we learn from. It's those failures where we figure out more about Yes. our risk tolerance, our pain threshold, yes. where we learn that we can keep putting one foot in front of the other, even when it's hard, even when it's painful, even when we're exhausted, you can always yes. take one more step. And what I learned is that the people that get to the top of that mountain, they're not necessarily the strongest or the most skilled. They're the people who are willing to endure pain and who are willing to keep going. Yes. When other people are not, they are willing to just put one foot in front of the other when they really can't see what's down the trail, when they're getting pelted in the face with snow, when they feel like puking from altitude sickness, they still keep going. And it's just about being relentless. And that's how you climb all of life's mountains, all of life's mountains, the figurative mountains, as well as the literal ones, is you just realize you just put one foot in front of the other, you can keep going. Um, one foot in front of the other that, that that's a great lesson and uh and, and you know i i, I love you, you sort of talked about being on at the top when you get to the summit because so much emphasis right so much of our energy and attention and focus is on that end goal and and the process and leading up to it we oftentimes forget where that's where the true value lies right 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 and so i also i think when you achieve goals easily then you're just like, okay. And you don't really break it down as much and process it and try to learn from it. You're like, okay, I can do this. What's next? What's next? What's next? And, um, I think that when you have a big failure or a big disappointment, when you can really analyze it critically and break it down and figure out what went wrong, what can I do differently next time? You not only set yourself up for success, but you become a better leader and a better mentor and a better teacher to the people around you. And I always, you know, I bring up Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzig Norgay. I always like to talk about these guys because they were the first people to summit Mount Everest, right? In 1953, the first okay. guys to reach the top mm -hmm. and they became household names. They became very famous. I think President Obama is now making a documentary about Tenzing Norgay. And, you know, okay. obviously Sir Edmund mm -hmm. Hillary became a household name, but what people forget is that there were dozens of climbers who tried yes. and failed before those guys made it to the summit. But Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, those two had the benefit of all the data, all the research, all the information from those previous climbers. And granted, yeah. they didn't really get recognized. But if those guys hadn't had the guts, you know, the sheer courage to get out there on the mountain and try it try. first, I bet Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzig Norgay would never made it. You just don't know. Like what you have to remember is that yeah. when you're going to try really hard things, you're going to have to give yourself, you know, and your team some freedom to fail. You just got to come back from it better than the next time around. And you have to think about who might be following in your footsteps down the road. 
who will go on to achieve really great things, who will go on to climb really tall mountains because of your past experience. Yeah. Even if you didn't have the outcome you really wanted at the time. Oh, I, I, and, and, I, and I, I love that. It's a really good point, Allison, because we oftentimes, we forget that. We forget that our successes oftentimes are built on the failure of others. And it's the lessons that we've learned from them and the insights and, 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 and uh, the knowledge gained. All of those things have fed into where we've now acquired this new insights and these new knowledge and these new ways of doing things. And that's where the successes come in. Like, you know, yep. that's why, in, in, you know, when you have trial, you have trial and error in lab experiments, right? There's trials. They're expecting to fail and they're expecting to take from those failures to build on more successes. Right, right. Like, look at even like almost any great invention, any vaccine, any cure for anything. You know, there have been a oh, million missteps, a million failures in the process, right? And people just look at that as making progress. They don't look at it as a setback. Yeah, no, that, that totally, totally is another fantastic point. And, you know, I, I think the insights are great the insights you learn from the mountain, which, you know, you probably never would have thought that you walked away with it with with all of this. But uh, I and, 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 and so to, to that point of sharing the fact that you've been able to take and, and share them the way you have and share them with audiences or even through your book over the edge, it, it really gives some insights so people can walk away from tangible and go, OK, yeah, I may not be, climb mountains, but the lessons still yeah, apply. They do because everyone has mountains to climb in their life, right? The figurative mountains, everybody has mountains, everybody has challenges. And right now, nobody has visibility as to what's coming down the trail. That's right. And that's the thing is you, you don't have to have that visibility. You just have to know you can put one foot in front of the other and you can yeah. always do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also uh, really appreciated hearing your message about being it's OK to be afraid and brave at the same time. Um, yeah. and, and I think that for a lot of people, that's another key one, because uh, fear can control us or we can embrace it and go off and do great things. But our response to it really is the key in this. That's exactly right. You are spot on with that. You know, what we have to remember is that fear is just a normal human emotion. And I think if mm. you were to ask people to put fear in, in one of two boxes, a positive emotion or a negative emotion, most people would see it as a negative emotion. And when they feel fear, they think, oh, I'm scared. What's wrong with me? You know, how come other people aren't feeling this? It's okay to feel fear. It is a normal human emotion. I think if you don't feel fear when you're in scary situations, you are not paying attention. Mm. You should feel fear right? When you're facing the unknown, but it doesn't mean you can't keep going. And so I tell people all the time, fear is a normal human emotion. Do not ever beat yourself up for feeling scared. Fear is only bad if it paralyzes you. So you learn to use fear to your advantage. For me, fear keeps me alert, yep. aware of everything going on around me. And what I realize is, you know, fear is normal. It's complacency that puts you at risk. Fear doesn't put you at risk complacency does. You have to be able to keep moving even when you feel fear. And that's yes. why you know, I'm glad you brought this up that you can, you can feel scared and brave yes. at the same time. You can, you can be scared and brave at the same time. It's accept the fear and just keep going anyway. Yeah, no, I, I, I love it. I think it's a really another, an, another fantastic point because it's something that we're all going to have to face, Allison, at some point or another. Yes. We've all got whether, you know, the height, spiders, whatever your fear is, you're going to have to at some point confront it. And I think that's the, and, and acknowledging that it's there, acknowledging that because you're absolutely right. It does keep you aware and alert what's happening around you. And then you have the opportunity to now, okay, fine. I've acknowledged you. I'm going to keep going now. And just the confidence that it builds, right? When you adopt that mindset and you do keep going, it really builds confidence. And then in the future, when you face something that's even scarier or feels bigger or feels more overwhelming, then you just have to think to yourself, okay, well, hang on, because I kind of felt like this before and I kept going then, so I can keep going now. Got you. Got you. Oh, listen, that's great. You know, it's, as I was sort of preparing for, for our conversation, uh, again, this whole world isn't mine at all. I had to learn a little bit about it. And the, the Adventure Grand Slam was something that I had to come across. I'm like, oh, yeah. I wonder if you sort of talk about that because I, I had never heard. Of, I mean, sure. I've heard of Grand Slams, but not the Adventure one. 
Right. So I see. So I didn't even know about the adventure grand slam until I completed it. I just wow. knew about the, the Denny's breakfast grand slam, which <laughs> I was a, a big fan of. Um, yeah, but too. so the adventure grand slam is climbing the seven summits, which is the highest peak on each continent. And then skiing to both the North and the South pole. That is the adventure grand slam. I think there's about, uh, two dozen people in the world now who have completed the adventure wow. grand slam. But at the time there were only a couple of us, but I didn't even when back when I did it in 2010, I think there were two of us or something, but I, I didn't even know what it was. I just thought that, um, you know, I was climbing Everest and somebody, uh, somebody in our dining tent was at just asking everyone else like, Oh, what else have you climbed? Where else have you been? And so I, mentioned, oh, I've climbed, you know, six of the seven summits and I skied to the North Pole and the South Pole. And they're like, wait, so if you summit Everest on this trip, that's the Adventure Grand Slam. And I thought, what, Whoa. what is that? You know, and they told me about it. So then I was even more excited because I thought maybe I would get free breakfast at Denny's for life, <laughs> but they have yet to offer that to me. Uh, but it was kind of cool to, you know, have completed uh. that. And I just always also wanted to point out to people that when you complete something like the adventure grand slam it's you know, it's really cool to have done that but there's so many people that make it possible right your teams your guides the sherpa support like there's no way i could have summited everest without the support of the amazing sherpa team that was with us the whole way we had incredible guides along yeah. the way that gave us direction i mean there were a lot of people that had a hand in my success there really were. And I always tell people, nobody gets to the top of that mountain by themselves, yeah. right? Nobody does. There are a lot of people because people tend to have these hero shots of them standing on top of the mountain, you know, Isaac's in the air. Here I am at the summit of Everest. But you, so you see them at the top, but you don't see all the people that behind the camera taking a picture, them. right? You don't see the people that are behind that camera taking that picture, helping right. to create that moment, right. right? So you're right. And, and I think yeah. I agree. everything from, like the sponsors that funded yes. the trip, the logistics providers that got the permits in order. Like I said, the amazing Sherpas that ferry loads up and down the mountain. Like everyone has their hero shot at the top of the mountain, but there's a lot of people that were involved in that success. Yeah. And, and you raise a really good point about just teamwork in general and having, you know, that a, a reliable team because you're, you're not getting up that mountain by yourself and no. you're, you're going to get support all the way through. And I think that's really important to also acknowledge. So that's fantastic. Allison, this has been so great. I, I, I like I said, I, I just so love this chat and I really appreciate uh, the, the, the lessons that you, you've shared. Uh, it's funny. I, I oftentimes I'll, I'll ask guests, you know, hey, this is since this is the Audacious Living podcast, tell me the most audacious thing you've ever done. But I think I already know with you, right? Like, <laughs> I already know. Well, OK, I would say, you know, climbing ever. But when I was. Um, a college junior, uh -huh. I was living in LA, uh, working, doing, doing a marketing in, internship for Mattel toys. And I tried to deliver a pizza to Michael J. Fox's house because <laughs> I was like obsessed with him and was a big fan. So that was rather audacious too, but the, I rang the bell, but the security people just told me if I didn't leave immediately, they were going to call uh, the police. So uh, I didn't okay. get to deliver my pizza. But. Gotcha. Another fail goal. Look at you, right? Did you get to the summit? <laughs> I was just proud of myself. Like, I can't tell you how I even got his address, but I did get his address. That's and amazing. Like, deliver a pizza. Maybe they'll let me in the gate. No, but, but you know, there you go. <laughs> that's amazing. You know, it's so funny. It's funny. Like uh, so often we, you know, I know we're joking about this, but oftentimes, you know, when we, we go after these things and go after these goals and try these new things, the one thing that undoubtedly happens, regardless, you know, even if we, we get to the summit or not, is that people around us seeing things, see what we're doing and the ability to inspire. Like I, I, I would imagine that, you know, you, you've motivated, inspired countless individuals to do the same or try to achieve greater just by through, through your actions. And I think that's a really, really important point in terms of how we can positively impact other people. I think, right. When people see somebody working through adversity, then yeah. it gives them motivation to try to work through their own adversity. So um, in addition to my heart surgeries, I suffer from something called Raynaud's disease, which is okay. a neurological disease that causes 
the nerves to clamp down on the arteries and my fingers and toes. And it cuts off all my circulation and leaves me at extreme risk for frostbite. So I have to manage that. And doctors always told me to avoid cold environments. And of course, where do I go? The North pole, the South pole, you know, big mountains, Mount Everest. And so, um, I learned to manage it. I manage it with these, you know, just those $2 $2 chemical hand warmers that people use when yes. they go skiing or when it's cold. And so I learned that I could manage it, but you know, throughout your life, people are going to tell, you, no, people are going to tell you things can't be done or shouldn't be done. And you, there's almost always a way around it. There's yes. almost always a way around it. I have a friend named Kara Golden who, um, she founded um, hint water. Okay. And one of my favorite quotes that she talks about is she said, I always, cause people told her, Oh, fruit flavored water. People, a million people have tried that. They can't get it done. The, the ingredients will break down. The fruit flavoring will break down or whatever. It just doesn't work. Everyone's tried it. And she said, I always believed that no means maybe, and maybe means yes. And throughout her career, people always told her, no, 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 things can't be done. But she just didn't listen to that. And if you turn away every time someone tells you, no, you're never going to achieve your goals, right? You're never going to feel like you can go after your dreams. And so when someone tells you, no, you just look at that as a challenge. You just look them in the face and say, watch me. And I know also sometimes it can feel overwhelming, right? People think like, oh, I'm never going to climb Mount Everest. Well, you don't have to climb Mount Everest, but um, I'll quote another friend of mine, Leslie Blodgett, who, um, she has a book called pretty good advice. She comes from the beauty industry. She was the okay. founder and CEO of bare minerals. Um, and she said, you know, everyone talks about having to set these really high bars, right? These really high goals, really high bars. She goes, I believe in setting the bar low. And she said, set the bar low where, you know, you can clear it and mm-hmm. then set it a little bit higher and then set it a little bit higher and higher after that. And pretty soon you have built yourself a ladder and you can climb as high as you want to. And so I like that, you know, everyone's like, go big, go big, go big. Like sometimes it makes sense to not go big. Right. Sometimes it makes sense to go smaller and build your confidence and build your skills. And right. Right. That's the, well, that, that's creating momentum too, right? As you go yeah. one at a time and creating goals. So that's, that's, that's so awesome. Allison, uh, let our listeners know where they can uh, uh, learn about what, what you, your book. You, you had a documentary uh, as well. Uh, yeah. For, that is, I'm which working I, on a documentary about, okay. thanks for, um, for asking about that. It's, yeah. uh, it's called Sherpani. It's about the first female Sherpa okay. to ever summit Mount Everest. And it's, she's an amazing story because she grew up, she was dirt poor, couldn't read, couldn't write, couldn't even speak the national language in Nepal because Sherpas have a different dialect, but right. she had a dream to climb Mount Everest, but the government of Nepal at the time, this is in the late 1980s, early nineties, they would not uh-huh. let female Sherpas climb. They would only okay. let the men climb. Gotcha. And the women were very much discriminated against. And um, they're uh, a religious minority in Nepal too. They're Buddhist in a Hindu culture. And so she, even though she couldn't read, write, or speak language, she fought the government of Nepal for equal rights for all women in Nepal. And she, because her point was, wow, you guys let all these foreign women come to our country and climb wow. this mountain. And I'm not allowed to simply because I'm of Sherpa descent. Like that mm-hmm. is discrimination. Yeah. So she finally was granted access to the mountain. She tried three times initially unsuccessfully. Okay. Okay. She finally summited on her fourth attempt in 1993, becoming the first female Sherpa and the first woman from Nepal to summit this mountain. Yeah. But she died on the way down. Mm-hmm. So she never got to tell her story. So I'm working on a film about her so people can find me and can find um, a film trailer yep. on my website. It's just alisonlevine.com. Um, I'm Amazing. not on social media very much. And it's mostly just pictures of my dog when I am, but you can also <laughs> reach out on it's Levine underscore Allison. So um, yeah, so that's Amazing. it. And I just, if I could leave everybody with one thought, it's yeah. just to remember that Look, everyone, everyone has mountains in their life to climb. And I want people to remember that you don't have to climb Mount Everest to have impact. I want people to remember that simply being there to share a few kind words of support to somebody who is struggling can completely change the outcome of a situation and can completely change somebody's life. Just being there for people to lean on when they're having a tough time 
that is helping them climb their mountains. And that's how you really have impact in, in life, right? Standing on top of a pile of rock and ice doesn't change the world, but being there to show kindness and compassion to your fellow human beings, that changes the world. It does. And I will say to, to add to that, Allison's a fantastic point. And we're at a time where it's, it's certainly needed more than so ever before. And, you know, we can exercise that kindness and compassion and love to one another. Uh, you're, you're right. This will be a, a great place. So thank you for sharing that. And thanks for being here, man. This is so amazing. I've had such a great time. Loved hearing your stories. Loved the lessons. And I appreciate the insight. So thank you so much. It's been my honor to be your guest. I'm so pleased that you invited me. I love your spirit. I love your energy. I love your messaging. And I love that you have made it your mission to share so much with the world. So many things that can help people out there. So I'm a oh, big admirer and I'm, I'm you. really, I feel so honored to be your guest today. Thank you very much. And like I said before, we're twinning with the blue. So there we go. Yeah. We're on the same page. <laughs> yep. Thanks, Allison. Back, we are here on the podcast. Thank you and shouts out to, to Allison. Uh, my appreciation goes out to you for being here on the Audacious Living Podcast and offering up some really good insights on, on climbing challenges and strategies that we can take and, and use in our own lives when it comes to overcoming those mountains that we face sometimes. You know, um, Allison really left us with, with so much to think about, but if there's, if there's just one thing that I take away from our conversation, it would be this. Mountains or, or challenges are an inevitable reality of life. They'll test us emotionally, psychologically, and physically. To further complicate matters, there's also the possibility that we'll be faced with effects of a rapidly changing environment and that can alter our visibility to the point where we can't see what's coming or, or what's ahead of us. Despite these factors, it's both our job and responsibility that we owe to ourselves to keep pushing, stay relentless, and continue to put one foot in front of the other until we reach our goal. Hey, listen, if you haven't registered for email notifications of the Audacious Living podcast, please know that you can do so uh, by heading over to Best audaciouslife.com all you've got to do is enter in your email address and you are immediately connected it's just that easy best audaciouslife.com is website uh, and you're set and uh, we've reached uh, the end of another episode and I want to take this opportunity to thank our listeners uh, your the, the support that you offer uh, it's been tremendous uh, it's been ongoing and I want to take this time to thank you know all my my lovers of audaciousness. Thank you for the support. Uh, thank you for being here, and we're gonna keep doing our thing uh, as long as you know we, we you know we, we, you you show us that love. So thank you, thank you. Can't say it enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Until next time, stay safe, be kind, show love to one another, and be audacious. You've been listening to the Audacious Living Podcast, hosted by Audley Stevenson. If you enjoyed what you heard, be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Until next time, be audacious.